In today's lecture, we would be looking at the seemingly uncorrelated regression models. In short, it is referred to as the SUR models. Now, the interesting part of the SUR models is that we have a set of regression equations which are seemingly unrelated to each other. That means, we can treat them separately. They have different regressors very often and the errors in this case, you can treat them separately if you want. But very often what happens is that the errors themselves are correlated. In spite of the regression equations being otherwise uncorrelated, because of the relationship between the errors, it is always better to estimate the regression equations simultaneously. So, we say it is seemingly uncorrelated, but actually these equations are correlated through the errors. This is what we will be looking at in today's lecture. The seemingly uncorrelated regression models are very commonly known as the SUR models or the SUR models. In this case, consider a set of G separate regressions. So, we have y j is equal to x j beta j plus e j, j running from 1 to g. We will call this equations 1. Now, if you look at these equations, we have x j's which are different for different equations. Some of them may be the same variables, but very often they can also be different variables, completely different variables. So, what we could have done in this case is that we could have looked at them separately. For instance, we have this the n dimensional vector. So, that we have n observations on y j and u j, which we have put together into this model. We have beta j as the p j dimensional parameter vector and we have x j as the n by p j matrix of covariance. So, x j's are generally uncorrelated with the u j's and hence the ordinary least squares could easily be applied separately to each of the g equations to get estimates of beta j. So, we get beta 1 from the first equation using the OLS on the first equation, beta 2 from the second equation. There was nothing that would have created any problem as such. This we can do when we do regressions in other sciences, in natural sciences or astronomical sciences and things like that. So, very often we can use this type of method separately for each of the separate equations. But in this case of economic problems, we very often have some relationship between the disturbances. So, we say that the disturbances u j's are correlated. We call this correlation contemporaneous correlation. So, we say that the u j's are contemporaneously correlated. And then the question arises, can we estimate the beta j more efficiently if we consider the g equation simultaneously rather than looking at them separately. Let me explain this whole concept through an example. Let us consider the demand for two commodities. In this case, I have assumed the two commodities to be mango and watermelon. So, the usual economic theory would tell you that the demand for a commodity would depend on its price. So, what we have is the demand for mango would depend on the price of the mango. So, if you assume that there is a linear relationship between the demand for mango and the price of mango, then we can write this as q m is equal to alpha naught plus alpha 1 m alpha 1 p m plus u m. We are assuming a linear demand function and alpha 1 generally would be negative. So, this would be a decreasing demand function. Similarly, the demand for watermelon can be written as q w equal to beta naught 
plus beta 1 p w plus e w. In this case p w is the price of watermelon. So, again we are assuming a demand function which is linear and beta 1 is going to be negative. But the thing is that the two demand functions are different. So, for each element like this, for each commodity, we can have a demand function build up in a similar fashion. Now, the problem is that should we be treating this demand function separately as we have here? The question arises because each commodity's demand depends on a host of other factors. For example, the demand would depend upon the income level. It would depend on the prices of similar commodities like other fruits, like the prices of apples and oranges, etc. So, if the prices of apples goes down, maybe the demand for both mango and watermelon would go down. If the prices of oranges go up, then probably the demand for mango and watermelon would also go up because you can use these as substitutes for oranges. So, it will depend on a host of other prices. The problem is when you build an economic model or an econometric model as such, you cannot include all the variables. There would be a very large number of variables which has small impacts on the response and it becomes both cumbrous and extremely difficult to interpret if you have a very large number of variables. So, obviously, we would think in terms of parsimony that is as small a model as possible and hence we will have as few explanatory variables as possible. So, as we see that you can build a model of demand for mango including the prices of watermelon, prices of apples, oranges, other fruits looking at the income level, looking at the taste habits etcetera of the people, but that would be a really big model. So, where does all these other variables go when we look at the demand for mango as q m is equal to alpha naught plus alpha 1 p m plus u m, we are just taking the price of mango. So, the quantities demand demanded is affected by so many things, where do they go? Obviously, they go into the error part. So, all the common factors or all the factors that we have not accounted for in the assignable part of the model goes into the error component. So, in case of mango, the prices of apples, income levels, oranges prices, etcetera, everything will go into the UM. Similarly, the income levels and the other prices would go into the UW of the watermelon. So, now what happens? Now, u m and u w have a lot of common factors and these common factors would move in the same direction, they would move together. So, can we say that the u's are unrelated? Possibly no. If we had thought of u m as simply errors, random errors, then we could have treated the two equations separately. But these are not random errors, these are disturbances which consist of some specification bias, some modeling bias and hence they may be correlated among themselves and we call this contemporaneous correlation. So, if you have correlation between the u m and the u w, should we be t looking at the demand function for mango and demand function for watermelon separately? or should we be taking them simultaneously. Now, let us look at a single model for all the g equations taken together. We take y 1, y 2, y g and write them in terms of the x's, beta's and u's in this manner. So, if you look at the first row, this gives you y 1 is equal to x 1 beta 1 plus u 1. The second gives you y 2 is equal to x 2 beta 2 plus u 2 and so on and so forth. So, you can put all the g equations together into a single model. We write this model as y is equal to x beta plus u. We will call this equation 2. 
Now, if you look at the covariance between u j and u k, we have said that these u's are uncorrelated, uh, are correlated to each other. We are assuming them to be correlated to each other. So, if the correlation between the jth and the kth errors are sigma j k, then we have sigma j k is equal to i n as the covariance matrix for the u vector and the k u j and the u k vectors. This for all of the j k's running from 1 to 0. Using this, we have expectation of u equal to 0 and the dispersion of u now comes out to be sigma cross i n, where sigma is composed of the elements sigma j k, which are the covariances between the errors from the different model. Of course, the diagonals are the variances of error from each of the models. Now, since the dispersion is not an identity matrix, it is not spherical, hence we need to apply the generalized disk squares to 2. So, using the GLS estimator on 2, we have beta hat is equal to x prime sigma inverse cross i n x whole thing inverse x prime sigma inverse cross i n into y. This would be the generalized least square estimator of beta. The expected value of beta hat is going to be equal to beta, which is usual because if you substitute y by x beta and then if you take the expectation, the term with, with u would be going to 0 and hence this will reduce to beta. And the dispersion comes out as x prime sigma inverse cross i n x whole thing inverse. These are the usual results that you get from a simple regression. Now, writing sigma inverse as sigma with the superscript of j k, we get the j th equation parameter estimates as beta j hat is equal to this function here. So, these are elements that we pick up from the beta hat in general. So, this would what would be beta j hat? This would be the jth set of parameters in beta. So, we pick up the corresponding elements from the right hand side which is given by the summation k equal to 1 to g sigma upper j k sigma j prime sigma k into the summation term there. Okay. So, this would be the individual betas for the individual equations. Let us make a comparison between the two. The usual ordinary square estimators for beta j from 1 would be, I will write it as beta j double hat is the usual estimator x k prime x k inverse x k prime y j. We use ordinary squares here, not the generalized disk squares because the variances are spherical in this case. You, you do not have the correlations coming in when you are looking at them simply. And the estimator is the best unbiased estimator among all estimators linear in y j. So, this is the usual result. So, you get the best unbiased estimator beta j double hat when you are treating them singly. So, how does the beta j hat which you have got from all the equations taken together, why is it supposed to be better? This is because the both are unbiased and minimum variance in a sense, but the first is the best among linear estimators in terms of the y j's that is the individual y's for each of the equations, whereas beta j hat is the best unbiased estimator among all estimators linear in y that is when you take account of all the responses from all the g equations. So, if you are looking at the set of y's then beta j hat gives you a the best unbiased estimator is better than beta j double hat and that can be shown and beta j hat is only best among when you are just restricting yourself to the j equation. So, we can always show that beta j hat will have a smaller variance than beta j double hat. So, this would be a better estimator. Now, the two estimators are equivalent under certain conditions. The first of them is when sigma is equal to i g that is the u j s are uncorrelated 
and you've assumed that the variances are equal to unity, so it's normed in the sense. So it, it will be either sigma equal to the diagonal also. What is important is that if sigma is equal to diagonal matrix, it really means that the errors from the different equations are uncorrelated with each other, which really means that you need not treat them simultaneously. They can be separately treated without losing much of the information. So, this is one condition. The other condition where the beta j hat simplifies to beta j double hat is when you have the condition that all the x k x 1 equal to x 2 equal to x q which means that all equations have the same regressors, the same number and the very same variables as regressors. So, in that case also this x would simplify to i j cross x 1 which is which can represent any of the axis will not be x 1, it could have been x 2 etcetera. So, in this case also the beta j estimator can be shown to simplify to beta j j hat. So, these are two conditions when the two estimators become CT one. Now, now, the question is that when you look at the estimator GLS estimator, the sigma would be unknown. So, we need to have an estimate for sigma. Where do you get the estimate for sigma? The easiest thing that you can do is do the regressions for each of the equations separately and from that you get your beta j double hats and then you can get the residuals as E j is equal to y j minus x j beta j double hat. This for all the equa g equations, g running from 1 to g. And then you can estimate sigma j k as sigma j k hat that is the estimate of the error variance between the jth and the kth equation that would be the residual from the jth equation prime the residual from the kth equation divided by the square root of their respective degrees of freedom. And then writing sigma hat as sigma j k hat, we substitute the sigma ha, sigma in the generalized disk k to get what is referred to as the estimated generalized least squares estimator of beta as beta hat e g l s, which is simply the beta hat g l s with sigma replaced by sigma hat, which is known. And that gives us the estimator for the CU model. In today's lecture, we considered the seemingly uncorrelated regression models. We saw that a set of independent looking regression models may be related to each other because their errors are correlated. This we have seen can be because of various reasons. We have seen how to deal with this set of models and it shows that if we deal with them simultaneously or together, then we get better estimates than if we deal with them singly. That is the reason why we need to look at this SUR models together, so that we can get better estimates of the regression parameters, although they look almost uncorrelated to each other.